The video you're now watching is of a young American basketball player collapsing during the game. This is called syncope in most literature. However, in Sri Lanka, there's a better name because it covers all sorts of people who feel dizzy or faint or a bit weird. So in Sri Lanka, this presentation is known as faintishness. Now, faintishness is a good cover all term, and I was going to do a talk on faintishness today. However, when you start looking, you realise what a huge topic syncope is. In the adult classification, you can see there's hundreds of causes, same in paediatrics. You can classify it by a pathophysiological basis as well. You can use flow charts, although they're so complicated they don't really help. You could try and simplify things by saying, well, let's just do a CTPA on everyone because 20% of patients will have a PE, according to this study. A little controversial. You could add to your cohort by saying that all your pre syncope patients should have a workup as well because this paper showed that their outcomes were nearly as bad as those with true syncope. But the reality is, what I wanted to do was focus on the most important subgroup of syncope, and that's the cardiogenic syncope, because it is related to the most adverse outcomes, both in the reasons why we admit patients to hospital, but also in those who are discharged where something terrible happens later. In Sri Lanka, this would probably therefore be a subclassification called extreme faintishness. So today I'm going to focus my talk on sudden cardiac death. I had the pleasure to give this lecture at the amazing Developing Emergency Medicine Conference held recently in Colombo, Sri Lanka. And it was a real privilege to attend there and network and meet such an amazing group of people. So sudden cardiac death is the second biggest killer to cancer in America and other Western nations. It's also the biggest killer of young athletes and a very high proportion of deaths in young healthy people. Most fatal rhythms that are caught are VF, however, there's a lot of evidence that possibly up to 40% of patients have a cardiovascular collapse, which isn't necessarily an arrhythmia. Most patients who die of sudden cardiac death are older with acquired heart disease. That's not surprising. And more than 50%, though, have had no prior diagnosis to the point where they collapse and die. Of the total numbers of sudden cardiac death, only 1% are less than 35 years of age. But if we look at the breakdown of the things that kill you, obviously coronary artery disease is going to be the most important. Non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, which includes myocarditis and valvular heart disease, for example, makes up a significant proportion. But of the group that are young, you can see that 30% die of sudden arrhythmic death syndrome. Sudden arrhythmic death syndrome is the cluster of diagnoses which kill young people, and they include long QT, Brugada, the catecholaminergic polymorphic VT, which causes a bidirectional VT and is actually a very deadly illness, early repolarization, which we'll come to later, Wolf Parkinson White, and the short QT interval syndrome. So if this young Candian dancer comes into the emergency department after a syncope, what should you do? Well, for an exertional syncope, you should assume that that was a sudden cardiac arrest if there's no other obvious cause. And there's good evidence to back this up. If you look at what kills athletes, and this is from a recent large uh, study in UK athletes, you find that the arrhythmic death syndrome makes up at least 43% of them. Patients also have LVH abnormalities found at autopsy, the arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathies of around 13%, but also coronary artery disease, hokum, and dilated cardiomyopathies. So when they come in, what investigations are useful? Now, the important thing to remember that most of the literature on sudden cardiac death in young people is actually from the athlete group, and this is because the large amount of money that's put into elite athletes worldwide. There is a high incidence of these athletes having arrhythmias, and therefore the people who pay them millions of dollars a year would like to try and protect them from this horrible event. So a lot of the literature is about athletes, but it's important to know when patients come in to the emergency department, They've usually already had a symptom. So when we're doing an ECG in this setting, we're usually not doing a screening test. We're doing 
a post-event test which is therefore going to have a much higher probability of discovering an abnormality than a screen will. If we're using guidelines to help us look at ECGs, for years people have used in athletes a European Society of Cardiology. However, these are non-specific and the cost per positive diagnosis is quite significant. So recently there's been variations published known as the Seattle Criteria which are significantly more specific than the European Society guidelines. I'm going to show you these normal criteria purely to let you know that in a trained athlete there are significant numbers of ECG abnormalities that actually don't change the chance of an adverse outcome. So things such as incomplete right bundle branch block or a Mobit second degree AV block really are normal in an athlete. You can see also that LVH is an expected problem as long as it doesn't have secondary repolarization abnormality. The Seattle criteria that are abnormal are really pathognomonic of serious disease. And these are the criteria that I really want to focus on today. So if you use these criteria when you look at ECGs in athletes, what do you find? Well, this is the pathology you pick up. Not surprisingly, Wolf Parkinson White is the most common, but you do find the some of the other sudden arrhythmic death syndrome culprits, but also some of those other causes of death on autopsy, such as Hokum coronary artery disease and dilated cardiomyopathy. So the screening tests pick up arrhythmogenic disorders as well as the structural heart disorders. I really want to focus on the ECGs of screening test today. Because really, in the emergency department, we are the first point of call. In general practice, it's uncommon for ECGs to be taken. And commonly, the ECG is taken potentially out of context to the symptoms. So people often come to the GP distant to the event which caused it. Now, the other thing is, is that we look at hundreds of ECGs a week. Some of these are going to be investigations for patients with symptoms. But some of these are also going to be true screening tests, like the athlete screening test. So I do think it's our obligation, in order to try and save lives in young people, that we are as expert as possible at ECG science. So let's start with wide QRS. In all the studies, wide QRS has a very strong association with sudden cardiac death, but it is non-specific. That is because people with established heart disease are likely to have wide QRS. Now we know that young patients shouldn't really have a broad QRS and I think this is a great thing to look for in the young healthy person. My current practice, if I see a broad QRS in an otherwise young healthy person, I do a bedside echo echocardiogram as a screen. If I notice any abnormalities on my bedside echo, I'll refer that patient for urgent formal echo and cardiology follow-up. The next ECG sign is one that you should recognize by now. It has been in the literature quite a lot recently, and its main feature is down-sloping ST segment elevation. So this sign is pathognomonic of the Brigada syndrome. Now, this coved ST segment elevation, which we see here, when it's found in a resting ECG, knowing that some patients will only get this pattern if given a flecainide stimulation test, or some develop it during stress, such as a fever. But if this is a resting pattern, this confers a higher risk of sudden cardiac death than the other subtypes of Brigada. The next pattern is either needle-like deep Q waves in infralateral leads, or massive T wave inversion in the septal leads. These are features which would suggest hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So in the ECG here, we have the apical variant, which shows giant T-wave inversion, particularly in the septal leads. Now, as we said, deep Q-waves, which are very deep as well as narrow, seen in infralateral leads, can also be significant abnormalities found in the non-apical variant. There is a subgroup of hokum that never gets any problems, but there are a subgroup that die early. And this can be arrhythmogenic, but it also can be from dynamic left ventricular outflow tract obstruction. Later in the illness, some patients do develop a dilated cardiomyopathy and need heart transplant. 
The arrow sign here is pointing to a tiny blip at the end of the QRS complex. The other feature in these three leads are deep T-wave inversion in the septal leads. You are noticing a bit of a pattern here with T-wave inversion in the septal leads being not a good thing. These little blips are known as epsilon waves and they are highly specific for the arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy. It has just changed its name from arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy because autopsy and MRI studies have shown that over time the fibrosis and scarring actually spreads out into the left ventricle as well. So early signs is T wave inversion such as in this ECG but by the time you've got advanced disease you will start seeing the epsilon waves. The patient should be symptomatic by then. And so you need to get these patients to EP studies to try and define their risk of sudden cardiac death, which varies up to 10% annually. The next feature is one that you will see reasonably commonly, and this may be drug-induced or congenital. In this situation, this very long QT interval is from a patient with the congenital long QT syndrome. This is a disorder of sodium channels and has up to 13 subtypes, with the mortality varying depending on which subtype you have. If you're measuring, you should measure in three leads and take the longest, and you should use the formula below to correct for rate. If you're just eyeballing the ECG, look for the end of the T wave to be greater than 50% of the RR interval. So more than halfway between the R waves for the end of the T waves is abnormal. Hopefully most of you are familiar with this sign on the ECG. What we're seeing here is a short PR interval and an upsloping early part of the QRS. So this is the classic delta wave of Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome. So Wolf-Parkinson-White, thankfully, doesn't have significantly high mortality. And that's because most people with an accessory pathway don't antidromically conduct through it to their ventricles. But the patients at high risk are those who get pre-excited atrial fibrillation, particularly those who have fast AF. Now, the mortality in the subgroup that risk is up to 0.25% per year. There is currently a lot of controversy about which patients with WPW you should send for EP screening because electrophysiology tests are not without complications. And in fact, the rate of complications parallels that of your risk of death from WPW. So I think the consensus would be that if you presented with a history of unexplained syncope or you're in found to be in pre-excited AF, those are the patients that you should try and get to an EP physician, not just to the standard cardiologist for follow-up when they have a WPW pattern found on a resting ECG. This pattern here is one you may not have seen before. What we're seeing here is very short QT interval with very tall and steep T waves with a narrow base. This is not hyperkalemia. This is the short QT syndrome. Now the pattern of this narrow T wave and short QT interval really without any ST segment is more common than the syndrome which thankfully is very rare. However, arrhythmogenic death from short QT syndrome is quite common. So although this is a very rare syndrome, it is worth looking for. And remember that the diagnosis really is for patients who have a QTC of less than 330 milliseconds. This next feature, although isolated to one lead in this example, is one you'll see all the time. What we're seeing is a J wave at the J point with a concave upward ST elevation segment. And this is classic for the early repolarization syndrome. Now, early repolarization was previously called BER for benign early repolarization. However, there has been a note made recently that of patients who have unexplained VF arrest, about 35% had an early repolarization pattern on their ECG. Now, this is greater than the risk in some populations. The general population have about 5 to 10%. In trained athletes, however, and in military young men, for example, the rate can be much higher, up to 30 to 40%. So, essentially, there has been an association shown between arrhythmogenic death and the early repolarization pattern. It's not causative 
but there is probably a subgroup of early repolarization at risk. So, if you have a patient and you find early repolarization and they are completely asymptomatic, you do not need to go further. However, a patient with unexplained syncopal episodes or documented VF with an early repolarization pattern really should go for further investigation. The signs on this ECG are usually found in older people or those who have survived congenital heart disease. So we're looking for three bits here, and they are a right bundle branch block, a prolonged PR interval, and a left axis deviation. Together, these three components make up features of the trifascicular block. Now, the trifascicular block is due to serious subnodal damage. So it's not AV nodal disease per se, it's damaged ventricle, which we know predisposes to death. Now, the progression to third degree AV block is probably only about 1-2% to 2 per year. And this has been shown in many longitudinal studies, including Framingham. So if your patients had unexplained syncope and they have a trifascicular block on their ECG, they really should be the patients who go for permanent pacemaker. So we've seen the current markers that we know about. Let's have a quick look at some of the future ECG markers for sudden cardiac death. Firstly, there's a fragmented QRS. Fragmentation of your QRS correlates with the degree of myocardial fibrosis or scarring. We know that having scarring and fibrosis in your heart leads to arrhythmias. This has not been properly defined yet about what exactly is fragmentation, how do you measure it, but certainly there are patterns on ECGs that we all look at where we see a funny looking QRS. In the setting of someone with syncope and this notched looking QRS, I think you should be more concerned than you would otherwise be. Heart rate variability is important because the way that the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems balance themselves out does help prevent arrhythmias. Now, both the heart rate effects we'll see here have been studied best in post-MI patients. So heart rate variability is the amount your heart rate changes at rest, and that's an index of parasympathetic function. If it's very consistent, it's not moving up and down with respiration, movement, etc., it does have correlation with increased risk of arrhythmia. Heart rate turbulence is even better. So after a ventricular ectopic beat, normally there's a pause followed by an increase in heart rate. If that doesn't happen, it's a good predictor of sudden cardiac death in post-AMI patients. This would be something you could watch on a monitor in the emergency department. T-wave markers are also important because T-wave looks at repolarization of the ventricle. T-wave alternance is a beat-to-beat -beat change in size or polarity of the T-wave. Now at high heart rates it can be normal, but at low heart rates, and particularly in those with a narrow QRS, then having T-wave alternance is a marker for sudden cardiac death, and this has been shown in many studies. The other one which is looking very promising is an index of repolarization time, which is the T peak to T end time. And the longer time here is associated with sudden cardiac death and work is being done at the moment to try and define this better. To summarize the ECG signs which you should always be worried about, as we've suggested, this septal T wave inversion, and particularly in the inferior leads, is always abnormal. ST depression in two or more leads should worry you pathological Q waves and two or more leads, and LVH that has secondary repolarization abnormality should make you worried. In summary, if a patient has presented to your ED with syncope, then I think you are obliged to become as good as you can be at looking at their ECGs, because it is a very valuable test. Once you've had symptoms, having an abnormal ECG is much more predictive of pathology than if that ECG was used as a screen only. An abnormal ECG should prompt further investigations, and the starting point should usually be a bedside followed by for formal echo and some sort of rhythm monitoring device. Now, halter monitors, we understand how frustrating they are. The patient wears them on many days but never gets symptoms. So, there is something coming, and that is a smartphone app where when you feel symptoms, you turn on your app, you get a single lead ECG recording from your thumb, and that recording is then emailed to your treating cardiologist. What a fantastic use of modern technology.
Thank you so much for listening to this Tick Me tutorial on sudden cardiac death. If you'd like to see what's happening in the world of Sri Lankan emergency medicine, go to my other website, www.srilankaemergency.wordpress.com.